dose, right? But what happens when Pac-Man eats a power pill? Who, who said it? He gets what? Then what happens? You can even eat the ghost, right? So what we try to do is create media advocacy power pill of a film, right? A film that can increase your awareness and your education in a very short amount of time. Let's think about political civic engagement and why most of us don't engage. We're either ignorant to the processes or we don't have time. Right? So I want to put you through a process where you don't have a lot of time looking at your watch. Seven minutes. Seven minutes, not seven or one. Seven minute power pit, right? And what happens is it increases their learning. And more times than not, when it's a very important issue, critical issue, it fueled to fight, right? And you can see it in their eyes. And when you see that fire in their eyes, get ready because the next thing they're going to want to do is fight. You don't have the tools that they can use to fight, then they can't advocate on their own behalf, right? So part of our mission is to do just that. Trap's not going to go to the Capitol and represent you. You are going to be empowered by the media. You're going to be empowered by the training to draw the maps by hand, right? To draw your own districts and present those districts in, on record, like we did, and we'll see the whole process that we went through to do that, right? And so what I want to begin with is the first slide and talk about why political civic engagement and why the folks that are moving forward, the crazy folks that are moving forward, we do this and we're trying to get you to do it as well. The number one way to put this democracy to the test is to make political civic engagement a part of your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with getting off work and going to a city council meeting, right? Because it's where they're making decisions about your community. If you learn those processes, you can fight to protect the right to run for office, all the right to elect, vote in a candidate of your choice to represent your what? To protect and advocate for your community interests. Now check out the question at the bottom. You have to ask yourself this. Does the current pool of incumbents representing your community write laws on your behalf? Or do you actively engage in influencing the shaping of those laws? Right? We want to talk about actively engaging, right? And so the first thing I want to show you guys, of course, is a film, right? A short seven minute power pill that ties, go back to the first slide for a moment, <clears throat> that ties censors and redistricting the voting rights, right? Now, what I'm leaving out of this, this whole piece is this, the historical backdrop of citizenship. Now, I primarily focus my work on African American boys and men, right? And we talk about citizenship, not only to connect ethnic groups about immigration. Uh, because we weren't brought here, we didn't migrate here or immigrate here. We were brought here to chat, right? To video to talk to, me, to talk to speak to. Uh, but once we acquired citizenship, we acquired the right to be counted in the census. And when we acquired the right to be counted in the census, for the first time we had the opportunity to call up a political power, right? By forming majority of the districts, right? So census and redistricting is a way to protect our voting rights or advance those rights, right? And so let's go to the first power pill now. Before, before you go to the third slur slide, I just want to tell you <clears throat> that there's some very, very cool people on this video, right? Some of you, if you really get down, you might recognize them. And if you don't get down and you just don't recognize them, you'll be informed, you'll be empowered to know that. You can check with all those folks, right? Hollis Watkins, Mississippi, Southern Echo. Derek Johnson, president of Miss, uh, Mississippi NAACP. Of course, Brother Jacques Moriel, the director of our census that who's resigned a few months back, uh, Director Rose, and then uh, Brenda, H Brenda Hyde as well, who's also a demographer, organizer, and activist in Southern Africa, right? And so without further ado, let's check out the first power pill, seven minute video, census redistricting the voting rights. Other than being 
what will count as three fifths of the human being for the purpose of the census, uh, so that individuals who own child slaves could benefit from the federal support that uh, we, uh, that they could receive for having slaves, but yet not allowed to exercise any uh, rights that normal citizens uh, could exercise in this country. After the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, uh, we found that uh, many individuals going to the polls could not be cast an effective ballot. As a result of that, it took 14 years, nine trips to the Supreme Court, over redistricting, the drawing of the political boundaries to determine whether or not individuals would cast a ballot that were able to cast an effective ballot and elect candidates of their choice. Uh, fortunately, in Mississippi, that battle continued, and we were able to elect more African Americans to public office than any other state in the country. Ten percent of all elected officials who are of African descent reside in the state of Mississippi. I think it's important to uh, maintain uh, districts where minority voters can elect a candidate of their choice um, because of the long and shameful history of Louisiana with respect to uh, respecting the rights of ethnic minorities and other marginalized stakeholder groups. Under the Voting Rights Act, um, states uh, that were part of the open federacy and a few local jurisdictions around the country, those uh, jurisdictions that have a long and well-documented history uh, violate the rights of uh, voters of color are required to pre-clear any change in voting procedures, rules, or redistricting with the Justice Department. Um, that's the primary protection under the Voting Rights Act. We have to determine the method and process as well as the districts by which people get elected from. And if you have not understood that, if you don't know how that process worked, then you are totally dependent upon someone doing that for you. And if you don't know how it works, those that's doing it could not be doing it fair or in a just manner, and you would never know it. So it's important that you yourself get involved in the process, learn the process, so that you can contribute to the actual drawing of the districts. Just like by your being counted, you participated in the determining to what extent and the amount of resources that came into your state. The Census Bureau is a nonpartisan organization. Uh, even though the census counts determine the reapportionment and then inform the redistricting, we have nothing to do with this. Our job is to count everyone once and only once and in the right place. That's all we do. Then we give back the information to the to the people freely. Uh, that's our job. Uh, the the states handle redistricting. We actually do calculate the reapportionment counts, but that's the end of it. We are a non-political organization.
in Congress before Jim Crow came down. And then there was a long period of time, 30, 40 years, where there were absolutely no African American legislators in Congress, right? Then the Civil Rights Act. Next slide. Oh, back. One. One time. <laughs> the significance of Shirley Chisholm is that once we acquired the right to vote again, because we had the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in the 1800s, that was repealed once uh, Jim Crow folks took over the Supreme Court, et cetera, and, and they lined up their power and they excluded us from power, right? But once we were able to run again, the first person to run this time was a woman, right? An African American woman. That, that now, when we had the right to vote in the 1800s, only African American men had the right to vote. And for the first time, we were counted as a full person in the census and not three fourths, right? It's child. And so, uh, so let's go on to the next slide. What year was that? Go back. She was elected. Oh, she didn't. She didn't. Oh, she was elected to a uh, law office, but then she ran for president. She was okay. the first African American to run for president. Um, but yeah, Shirley Chisholm. Okay, and I, I basically talked, let us uh, segue into this. Uh, once the 14th Amendment was passed, it gave the African American men the right to become citizens in America, right? It also gave Native Americans and Chinese men as well. Um, for the first time, they were counted in the census. Now, this is we, we acquired the right to vote and citizenship in 1868. Two years later, we were counted in the census. Let's go to the next one. It was as if, I mean, well, first of all, you know, there, had, there were millions of slaves concentrated in the South, right? So once we had the opportunity to be counted in the census, it was instant political power, right? Because we were then able to form majority minority districts all over the South, right? And so the, just having slaves so heavily concentrated in the South came back to Biden for about 20 years, uh, 20, 30 years. Um, and so, you know, we sort of went through the, the, uh, the history there, which sort of brings us to the now, right? We've talked about count, talked about redistricting, we've talked about cultivating political power. Now let's fast forward to New Orleans, post Katrina. Now again, you know, initially, what really teed everyone off is, this area of the Lower Ninth Ward, this area of New Orleans East, the Gentilly, are heavily concentrated African-American homeowners. Now the very first rebuilding proposal that we saw made nearly 50% of the Lower Ninth Ward green space, big pockets of green space throughout New Orleans East, and big pockets of green space in Gentilly. Again, concentrating that green space in areas where African-Americans work, right? And so, um, we lost 118,000 African Americans out of 150 or 180,000 people after the storm. It was going to make for an interesting redistricting fight. Can I ask a question? Sure. Where on the map are we now? I'm sorry. Where, like, where on the map are we right now? <coughs> so we're, we're in America. <coughs> Maybe about right here. You know? This is sort of the upper night floor. And the green. I can't quite read the key. This the green represents what number? Changes. Changes population since 2000. Since 2000, right? And so you just see, um, and this is after the storm, right? And so you see less green in these areas. So it sort of goes from here to here to here. And so this represents the actual population loss, right? And there's um, another power appeal I want to give you guys, which is a documentary power appeal, right? Now, there's a difference between the media advocacy power pill and the docu-film power pill, right? The media advocacy pill is about seven minutes. The next the documentary piece runs about 19, 20 minutes, right? And so I want you guys to sit through this film for one reason and one reason only. You actually get to see how the forced depopulation happened in three ways. One, through eliminating public housing when people came back to the city after the storm, public housing was boarded up and fenced. People were not allowed to get their belongings out of the out of the house, out of their homes, and the homes were set to be bulldozed. Activists, advocates, lawyers stood in the way of making that happen, right? And so you'll see that the fight for uh, public housing. And, and the thing to remember about the fight for public housing is people were fighting for one for one replacement. It was never about moving back into those the, 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 the 
deplorable conditions, right? But the important thing to remember about those housing developments is they were the most sturdy buildings in, in the city, right? And so most of them were not even damaged. Again, it was a concentrated attack, folks, right? So just, I want you guys to check out Crescent City Exodus. It's an excerpt from a larger film that we will not release in its entirety until the 10th year anniversary of Katrina, right? And we can clearly see then how much the city has changed. And we'll get to show folks how the city changed, right? So please check out uh,
there is a certain level of overlap. But you know, if you look at um, African American survivors uh, post Hurricane Katrina, they were essentially locked out of the Reconstruction effort. No housing, no access to jobs, um, no transportation. The infrastructure of the city was basically left in disarray, and in some cases. Um, the disarray was created by the government agencies, such as Hanno and HUD, locking down public housing. I mean, that's a very simple way to make sure that you have a certain workforce that isn't able to return home, despite the fact that their homes were not damaged. Thank you, United, with all of you. We're the Congress of Day Laborers of New Orleans. We come from the different work corners all across the city, and we are here so that we can be in the struggle with you today and in the future.
early as the first week of October. This argument has been framed in a way that is erroneous. It's based on an erroneous logic, which is if we get a new veterans hospital, an LSU system clinic hospital, we can't open charity. Therefore, we can't provide mental health services and other health care services. The two are not mutually exclusive. We can go ahead with that, and at the same time, we're in the 21st century. We should be able to provide the other stuff at the same time while that's on the table being claimed. And that's what we're calling for. I know that the city council and President Bilko have been very supportive of the request. So we put, we basically took all of those um, those recovery and store episodes and created a composite of that, and that's the Crest CBX of this piece, right? But those three vignettes were basically used for one, the housing videos were used in the policy fight um, that Maxine Waters, um, you know, fought to have. It was a bill on for it was a affordable housing bill, but it wasn't the best bill. But we back, right? Uh, the second piece was an excerpt from the Low Wage Worker Rights video that we use as a tool to bring black and brown folks together to talk about what's really going on with employment and labor in the city and why we have to work together and not allow employees to pit us against one another, right? So it was a great organizing tool. The third piece um, was a piece that was near and dear to my heart as well as shock because it was actual footage of the clean hospital that LSU said was so damaged, right? And so um, it's the actual, the doctor, one of the resident doctor surgeons that, um, that worked at Cherry, he recorded that, that video, but then he later had to sign a gag order that he couldn't use the video, nor could they talk about what they did inside of the hospital, right? And so he gave the footage to me. <laughs> and so, um, but that, that video and, and you know, parts of it uh, and some of the other interviews that came out of that piece used in the, uh, the lawsuit against uh, LSU um, Fight for Charity Hospital, right? So they, they can be used in very various ways. Um, but to sort of talk about this political paradigm shift that happened as a result of the extreme loss of population, <sighs> we have to talk about the fact that for 30 years, really, uh, we had Majority, a majority African American led municipality, right? And over a very, very short period, it seemed like it changed overnight from majority black municipality to majority white municipality. 
one from having an African American mayor, sheriff, district attorney, um, city council to having a complete a majority white city council, white mayor, white sheriff, on and on, right? It's not completely bad, it's not completely good. But when you have uh, a large population of African Americans and, and all of the people that work within the municipality are white, what's that called? Don't be afraid to say it. Hey, hey, not exactly the same conditions, but let's be mindful, okay? So with that political paradigm shift, we saw, <laughs> we just realized that redistricting was going to be a mother, right? For one, we don't have our population numbers back. We fought long and hard to get people back in town to be counted in their bed, in their house on the day of the census, right? And this is, you still saw Dr. Groves on the um, video. We were trying to get them to have a field hearing in the region about census to get folks who actually still had residency in Orleans counted in Orleans. Now, again, he didn't want to politicize the census, so he agreed to meet with community leaders privately about some of the um, census form that were, forms that were not going out into rural areas, right? People in rural areas generally don't use P.O. box, but they don't send census forms to P.O. box, right? And so he came out, he met with us, and he put 100 workers back on the streets that went back out into those communities and got those forms in people's hands, right? And so sometimes the, the direct actions bring those leaders down that can actually make something happen, right? And then in that instance, uh, with Southern Echo and some other folks, we were able to have made that happen with the record growth. But again, with the extreme population loss of the result of the historical redistricting cycle in Louisiana. Go to the next slide, please. Now, here we go. This map, actually this map is a coin of Brother Morial. He was the first one to say, this looks like an octopus. <laughs> Actually, a octopus, right? I mean, God, that's, we don't have the image of what gerrymandering is, but you can replace it with this map, right? You can look at this map, how it gerrymanders down the river. It's a stovepipe here. I don't know if you guys went through all of the principles and all that good stuff, but I'll just shut them out. Stovepipes are illegal. You can't have this little precinct sticking out here, right? all of this happening over here, right? So what you did was you cracked a continuous district like this one. This is the district that they destroyed. This is the one we were fighting for. It encompasses the Lower Ninth Ward and all of New Orleans. Some of us took a ride back there last night. They cracked that district down the middle here, and they spread it over three parish or county areas, right? Which is amazing. It takes nearly an hour and a half to drive the district and you would need at least a quarter million to run it. This map retrogressed from five majority minority districts in the metro area to three, which never happens during the district, right? Well, the map that we produce retrogressed from five majority districts to four. We can keep four because instead of jumping the river here, or jumping the river here, or going off into an entirely different parish, we drop the lake, the lake in the slider, right? Which we knew would piss a lot of people off. <laughs> but you can't complain about jumping in the slider out of one parish when you just jump into three, right? And so, but this map actually graded out better than that map. And you'll actually see part of the testimony um, with myself, Brother John Muriel, and Senator, State Senator uh, Willard Lewis, who, um, who had to represent our community and trying to get their maps on the record, right? And so with that, I want to bring in Brother Shop so we can sort of talk talk you guys through sort of what happened at the Capitol. And I'm going to get Jock to reflect and force his memory to sort of reflect on this a little bit. Because of one important thing happened that blew our minds. But, we, but again, because we were prepared for the trainings and all of that, we were able to make something happen, right? And so I'll just go into the story a little bit, and Jock and I are going to tell the story, right? And so after the hand drawing training, we attended another training in North Carolina with a group called Southern Coalition on Social Justice. And at that meeting, we met a gentleman by the name of Tony Fairfax. Now, Tony is a serious demographer, right? The first one I ever met. Well, no, not technically, it was Hollis, was the one. Hollis trained us, right? Okay, Hollis said. How does they train us on the math tool for redistricting software, the actual software that the legislators use that we actually purchased, right? And so um, after the training with Fairfax, we felt a little bit more empowered 
because we now are working with the same software that the legislators are using, right? We're in the game now, right? So let's see. When can community folks turn in maps during the session? We don't know. <laughs> Guess what? They don't know. <laughs> no freaking body knows. <laughs> they drew this map with not one single input or suggestion from anyone in their districts. It's called it public protection. It's where the legislator goes behind doors in every district amongst themselves. And you guys help each other out, and you throw her under the bus, and y'all make it happen. And this is what happened. They threw Willie Lewis under the bus. We're not going to get into the drama. But um, so, so I want to fast forward to 2011, extraordinary session, extraordinary session, first of its kind in Louisiana history at the state capitol, right? They're going in to redistrict the entire state without you, right? So, I'm in California at an Amnesty International meeting, and I'm at the airport, and I get a call from Brother Jean. And he says, Trap, the maps are due tomorrow. <laughs> I'm like, we don't have any maps, <laughs> right? We're just, we have the North Shore Alliance and the South Shore Alliance and the Slot Out folks and the New Orleans East folks are coming together. Why? Because they naturally migrate to the North Shore. They still have their businesses and their church in the east, but they live on the north shore. They, but they also live in a super majority white district. 14 to 15 thousand African American Creole folks, Native American folks, that never had representation. So we're saying we've done something amazing. We've given them opportunity to be a part of their community again and have some pop political power, right? Get this call from Shot. It's like you gotta be here in the morning. I'm like, good thing the flight's coming in tonight, right? <laughs> Fast forward, get home, drive to the airport. I mean, drive to the Capitol the very next morning. Me, Jacques at the Capitol. We're in the hallway talking, right? A lot of action things are going on, right? I had never met Senator Willa Lewis, right? I'm in her community. Her residents are organized, over 3,000 of them, right? Signed on to the petition. But I never met her. So she comes out. Jacques introduced me to Senator Willa Lewis, and Jacques is very cool. Strategic guy. <laughs> Here's what he said to her. This is Brother Trap, and I work for him. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me of my cousin, you know, he's 10 years old. We're trying to get him to pass his 13 to get in the movies. He gets to the box office and we say, he's he's 13. He's like, no, I'm not, I'm 10. <laughs> so I shut up. <laughs> I remember that lesson, so I put my mouth shut. I didn't say Jacques doesn't work for me, he's the great shot. I work for him. I didn't say anything. <laughs> Passed muster with the senator. He had one little problem. I was not a part of the legislative black caucus. Neither was y'all. How are we going to get in? Out walks Tony Fairfax, who's from North Carolina, mind you. Why is he in Louisiana? He <coughs> just got a contract from the legislative black caucus to do all of their maps. No! Oh, I don't. So, Tony walks out, shot out. Hey, Tony, what's up? What's up, Trump? What are you doing? I call uh, the Legislative Black Caucus, can I get in with Tony Fairfax and draw a map for Senator Lewis? And they're like, you're not a member of the legislature. The legislature. Tell Jacques. Jacques calls the Senator out. <laughs> he says, he gotta get trapped in to get map for Senator. He just ran it right away, right? <clears throat> she says, okay. Out walks Katrina Jackson. Who's she? She's the executive director of the caucus. She walks down the hall. She says, I want to reserve time to get in there with Tony Fairfax and I want Trap to get in there with him. Matter of 15 minutes, all of this is blazing and happening, right? <laughs> We're sitting in the session, in walks Katrina, taps me on the shoulder, walk back, Jack and I, the Senator and Tony, we get a map together in a matter of 10 minutes. I may be exaggerating. <laughs> it was pretty effective. <laughs> but I want to I want Jacques to talk a little bit more about the details, if you can remember. How exactly did we get Senator Murray to get us time on the floor to at least get our maps on record. Mm. If our maps are not on record, they can do whatever they want with the obstacles map. They don't have an opposing map. They don't have anything on record that they can say, out with this, what do you have? Do you have anything better? Oh, you do? Let's take this, right? Remember, 
we we knew that we had to get an alternative plan on the record in order to have any standing we want to challenge you for that. Um, and they were playing fast and loose with the deadlines for submission of maps. There was a lot of funny stuff going on. And I, you know, I've been around the legislature really since I was a kid. My dad served in the legislature in the late 60s. And I really, you know, is storied and fabled and notorious as the Louisiana legislature is. <laughs> I have never really seen anything like this. I mean, it was, uh, it was the quintessential smoke-filled room where really, I think it was about four older white guys got together and drew a map and gave it to their demographer and said, turn this into a plan. And that's where this, what we began calling the Octopus District came from. And it was intended to protect um, incumbents. It wasn't intended to protect, to fairly represent anybody, to meet the law, to be a compact and contiguous district as the law requires. It was solely intended to protect incumbents. And because we had this big uh, loss of population, we had people who were displaced and dispersed across the state, they wanted to take greatest advantage of all of those conditions. So in this environment, we began organizing we knew we were in for a fight, but we had no idea that it was going to be anything like this. We thought we were maybe going to a boxing match, not an ultimate fight, mixed up with arts, pull out the knife, stab you in the head kind of fight. Mm -hmm. And um, so they notified us of the deadline after they had had a late night meeting of the Senate Rules Committee. They had a meeting, I think it was like 9.45, on Friday night. I think that's what I called you. It was a Friday night, and we met that following Saturday morning. And um, we had generally the outlines, and they hand drawn a map. And conceptually, we had gone around and vetted it with the stakeholder constituents um, to make sure that they supported it, that they had confidence that this plan conceptually would represent their interest and protect their rights. One thing that um, that trap uh, didn't mention is that a lot of people who had been displaced from Eastern New Orleans, pink area here, um, who had not been able to move back, were staying in Slide Gap, just across the lake in St. Tammany Parish. They were coming to work in New Orleans every day, coming in on the weekends, working on their houses. So we kept that. We tried to keep that community of interest together. Um, and then there's a, a long history of people who lived in New Orleans East over the last 20 years moving to Slidell because housing costs were cheaper, the school system was a little bit more stable. So in, 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 with all of this backdrop, we find out that we have to get a plan together and get it submitted. And um, we were able to make the deadline. And boy, when this map was submitted, Oh, hell no. <laughs> really. Because not only the incumbents affected who benefited from this map were upset, but they were upset that um, stakeholders had intruded on in the process. Uh, so we, had, we had kind of put the door in on the smoke field road. Did Cynthia participate in making the map? Or did y'all just make it and show it to her and she said, go? Well, we had been working on this map, on the conception of this map for a while. Um, and we were really trying to, it was really difficult because we also wanted to protect the gain of two African-American districts in the northern part of the state. Um, and we needed to keep those legislators as allies. So, you know, technically, statistically, and demographically, it was very, very difficult. We couldn't have done it without talking their past. For sure, and I mean, he is a brilliant demographer, um, and he applied, you know, incredibly. I mean, we came up, we turned this map into a plan in a matter of an hour and a half, and so that's something that usually takes days or weeks. Um, but Cindy Willis Lewis, actually, when we conceptually got this map together, we had this idea of instead of 
this thing snaking all around with the, and going to represent three different parishes that we would keep this community of interest together. She was, she conceptually supported it. Um, and, you know, the, the, the ultimate outcome was they, they passed what was substantially this method, some much, very minor changes that really did not affect anything. Um, I but, think they cut off this appendix, right? One of, no, they cut this one. They cut this one. They, yeah, they, they cut that one off. Um, but what it, what, it, what it ended up doing, what it ended up doing is leaving a majority African American district on the West Bank that was represented, um, that had been a, majority, a narrowly majority white district, was represented uh, after it was majority minority by a white senator who was Jim, one of Jim's floor leaders and the chair of the Health and Welfare Committee. Oh, Jesus. And in Louisiana, in Louisiana, the Louisiana legislature is really, it's a, it's a separate branch of government, but it doesn't operate independently. Um, the presiding officers of the House and the Senate are not elected by members. They're chosen by the governor. So ultimately, the governor decides who's going to chair the legislature. Um, wow. and yeah, and, and practically that's what happens. And what, just as an aside, what's happened over the last year and a half, there are, case, there are two cases where legislative chairman disagreed with the governor on a single piece of legislation, and he summarily removed them. And, and what did you say? He summarily removed them from their leadership position. Mm -hmm. um, but back, back, back to this, so, we had an opportunity. We wanted to get this map in the record. So we had to get a hearing before the uh, Senate Governmental Affairs Committee. And they did not want to hold the hearing. They knew that getting this map on the record was the first step to a possible legal change. And uh, Senator Ed Murray, uh, who represents New Orleans, he's, he was my state senator. This <laughs> He, um, uh, he's an old friend. We grew up together, played football in the street when we were four or five years old. He's a, a former Army officer, brilliant attorney, and a, a great behind the scenes legislative tactician and consensus builder. And um, we didn't think we were going to be able to get him up on the right. Uh, and he, I think, you know, may have issued some. Private threats. <laughs> uh, he suggested that if if, uh, if we were not able to get a hearing on this map, uh, one that his opinion as a lawyer was that it would give us give us great grounds for legal challenge. Two, uh, and I think most convincingly, that he would leave some of these people in New Orleans who had suffered all of these injustices, leave us with nothing to. Do and reason with them that the worst adversary you could have is somebody with nothing to do. Um, so we finally able to get a hearing. And the incredible thing about the hearing is that we had the stakeholders, the people most affected, to come and testify. I think we had uh, 16 neighborhood associations and homeowner associations represented at that hearing. Um, they even had to say that we've never seen this many more ladies in a committee meeting advocating on their own behalf. And these are folks who were, we didn't have to teach them much, much about the redistricting process. They knew what was up, but they had never had the tools to engage, right? And so for the first time, they're coming forward with ways over the course of the extraordinary session to testify on behalf of keeping their, their, their community compact. And, uh, you know, the, the thing, what happened in this case is New Orleans East, for those of you who don't know, is a, a majority African-American, pre-Katrina was a majority African-American neighborhood. It was mostly middle and working class. Um, and a lot of the community leadership lived there. A lot of school teachers had jobs protected by the union contract. Uh, a lot of professionals and other members, people who were independent and who really kind of function as a, as a leadership class. And these are the people who uh, were the leaders in their congregations. 
Um, these were the people who, in the barbershop or the beauty shop, when people had a dispute about an issue of public interest, they'd say, trap what you think. Mm -hmm. um, so they were sophisticated enough to get very quickly, to advocate on their own behalf, and they had the, the resources and flexibility to actually travel to the Capitol, not once or twice, but there was some that were there every day for two weeks. Every day. Every day. Um, at the end, you know, I'm sad to say that we did not win this back. Um, but I think it amplified. We were able to protect the two additional African American districts in the northern part of the state because when we introduced that, some of the legislative leadership said, oh, you know what? You're going you're gonna to put that on the record? Uh -huh. We're going to take these two away from you in Shreveport. Um, so at the end of the day, they passed something that looked like this. Um, we explored a legal challenge based on this, and you know, after a great deal of research and discussion, um, we concluded that without a substantial amount, um, probably something approaching a million dollars, that we had no chance of mounting a legal challenge, that we probably uh, would only have less than 20% chance of winning. Not because of the merits of this, but primarily because of the federal appellate court that has jurisdiction here. Mm -hmm. And those of you who might live in uh, Texas, you know about the gift of the Circuit Court of Appeal. It's the most conservative federal court of appeal. It's packed with uh, appointees of uh, George Bush the father and George W. Bush. Um, and it is the absolute worst. Uh, but just FYI, if you do live in Louisiana, uh, Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, there are five vacancies coming up on that board that President Obama is going to have a chance to fill. And I hope if you do live in any place that has uh, that the Fifth Circuit has jurisdiction over, that you keep an eye out on that, that you, um, you know, work with your local communities to try to encourage people to be considered, um, who are going to be progressive, who are going to respect the rights of stakeholders, especially at the grassroots level, uh, who share your values, and also people who are young enough to serve for a long time. Mm -hmm. what, the, uh, what the Bushes did is they, they appointed people to the federal bench, very, mm -hmm. um, especially Bush the father. He, was, he appointed some appellate court judges who were in their 30s. Mm -hmm. Maybe they served 30 years or more. Yeah. Um, and it had a great lasting effect. Um, but, you know, what this fight over redistricting did uh, for a lot of people, uh, both stakeholders, observers, and allies, is it really amplified all of the struggles, <coughs> and the cynical schemes that um, it validated what we believe that uh, in order to close down public housing, not reopen the public hospital, um, and the intent was to discourage working people from returning. Now, public housing, um, our public hospital, these subsidize not the people who live there. They really subsidize the business community. Because they're able to pay a, essentially a slave wage to people who work in the service and business industry. Because there is public housing available because there was a public hospital. And while we didn't have access to primary and preventative care before Katrina, uh, we did have Charity Hospital, was one of the two or three best public hospitals uh, in the country. It was always rated really one of the top two trauma centers in the entire country. And um, you know it had a great mental and behavioral health program. And we lost all of that. So the effect of that was that Families with children, older people who are worried about their access to health care, families with children who are worried about access to, to public, public education near their homes, public education schools that they're familiar with. To the, the practical effect was to discourage those people from returning. Keep them out as long as possible. Hope that they can grow these houses so they can remake the, the whole social and economic democracy. And they actually revealed this, if you recall, 
and so they can do all their call as well. Just two weeks after Katrina, on September 8th of uh, 2005, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal, written by a reporter who had spent some time um, working as a reporter in the world. Well, one of the self-anointed civics and socialists elite admitted that they, their intent was to remake New Orleans into a wider, richer city. Uh, and, you know, we fought against that. I think we have had some measure of success. Uh, but we still struggle with public housing and public education principles. All the public services, but uh, public housing and public uh, public housing and uh, public health, we struggle with that still to this day. Um, in New Orleans, we don't have neighborhood schools anymore. Um, we have what's called an open enrollment. So the role that a uh, public school might have played in binding a community together, giving it identity, uh, a place where uh, parents discuss common problems in the community, not just with respect to their children. Uh, we've lost all of that, all of that. Um, on public health, um, you saw in the film that Charity Hospital was ready to open at the end of September. Uh, and General Honoré, who you remember was the hero of Katrina, who led all the military forces, actually will tell you that. And he actually called Governor Blanco up at the end of September and said, Governor, I just inspected the hospital with the U.S. Public Health Service. It's ready to send your people down here. And Governor Blanco says, well, thank you, General. We're not going to be reopening the hospital. We're going to be in the direction. And he was befuddled um, for, for really for years after that. Until it was revealed that this was the simple scheme that we thought. Um, if they reopened that hospital, they would not have later been able to claim to FEMA that it was at least 50% destroyed. And uh, a public facility, in order to get replacement value to FEMA, has to be 50% or more destroyed. So if it had ever reopened, they could not have claimed that it was 50% destroyed. What, and, from that claim, they got $497 million from the federal government that they didn't deserve. So that's $497 million of your money and mine. Um, and they're using it to build a, a mega money pit. A mega money pit, a new public hospital. They destroyed an entire neighborhood, displaced more than 1,000 families um, in the heart of the city uh, to build what we call the Taj Mahal. <laughs> And the hospital is uh, you know, a monument, perhaps, to go to Bobby Jim, but um, it's not financially or fiscally sustainable. Even if uh, Governor Jim were to take Medicaid expansion, that hospital would still require a public subsidy of at least $100 to $120 million. Um, and so, so that's one hundred something million that's still unused. All going into construction of, the new, of, of this new hospital. The state had appropriated uh, $300 million to renovate Charity Hospital before the trip. Had not spent any of it. They were going to renovate and expand it. It was a fairly limited program. The hospital was never going to close. Um, they used that $497 plus the $300 million, plus some focus pocus on the books to come up with $980 million to build this new Taj Mahal Hospital. That uh, is not going to open for at least two years at the soonest. And 10 years later. 10 years later. And um, you know, even when it does open, you know, unless there's some um, financial uh, magic that they can work, and, and that it works on financial magic that is sustainable, it's going to go bankrupt and grow. How, how are we doing on time? We have about five we're, minutes. We're out of time? Yes. Oh, we're, we're, out. Minute, we're about five minutes over right now, so we could probably go another five-ish mm -hmm. at most. But okay. What time do we have to get out of here? Um, well, after this, we have another, another presentation break. and then a break. Well, we're going to have a break before the next piece. 
Um, but I do. Right? Yeah, oh, we still do. do. And then we have um, we have some work in this room for that facilitator. I think we're here. Okay, so I feel like we're all very. Um, it's very, it's full, right? It's a lot. And I, and um, the thing I wanted to say is, as we were driving here on the bus, if you saw the large construction cranes on the left side of the freeway, I meant to actually say it as we drove by that that's the hospital that they're talking about, the Taj Hospital. And hopefully, on our way to our next spot or at some point, you'll see it. It's it's, it's that big construction on the other side of the freeway from the dump, right? And it's really lit up at night. Because yeah, there's like a wasteland. And, and, and Emerson Thrives, Emerson was a thriving working class neighborhood. Uh, you know, regular folks who work every day very hard. Their homes, most of them, were severely damaged by Katrina. The mayor said, come on home. A lot of these people got money through the road home program to fix up their houses. A lot of them used their savings and whatever insurance they could get. They fixed up their houses. They came back. And two years later, they told them, get, get your stuff. And expropriate their homes and demolish them. Let's take the, the next four minutes to just fill the questions and then we'll, we'll bring it right in for my presentation. I'm sorry, Mickey? Yeah, well, I'm wondering, so I'm wondering about like, this issue with the bridge. Um, so, and so I'm wondering if you have any background on the bridge, what that means, and that has anything to do with it. They, they built that Claiborne Bridge, and not the Hotel Bridge. Now, oh, that runs right through the historical for me. Yeah, and that's what she was close to my heart because I, I live a block from there and been working on the, that issue. Um, right now, they're in the update is right now they're in the midst of a fairly extensive study. Um, we, you know, my neighbors and I, we're disappointed so far because the outreach and stakeholder input has been insufficient. Um, they had, I think, eight uh, outreach sessions uh, in uh, late November, December. And I think uh, they had an outreach budget of well over $100,000. Mm -hmm. And they got only 308 people. Uh, what's the issue? Um, they built an elevated freeway uh, through the heart of a historic, principally African-American neighborhood. It was a beautiful boulevard four rows of huge live oak trees and it was that public space uh, was essential to the cultural development and identity of the city. And it was also the black business district. So they built this elevated highway yeah. Yeah, in, in between 63 and 66. Um, it destroyed that neighborhood and um, right now since the, the elevated highway is reaching what is the end of its useful life, meaning that they're going to have to spend a substantial amount of money to refurbish and rebuild it to get another 30 or 40 years out of it. You know, we've really kind of forced and stakeholders have demanded that there be an examination of taking it down and restoring it for a while to what it was. One of the big problems we have with that is um, it's a practical problem, it's a transportation planner's problem. Because they built the Taj Mahal Hospital and the city surrendered the street for it. Um, taking it down and returning the traffic to surface arteries is more difficult because you, you reach a bottom of it where they've turned over the street grid. The, the terrible thing about this Taj Mahal Hospital is it's, it's a suburban campus right. in the middle of the city with asphalt parking lots mm -hmm. and fences around it. It's not a walkable urban medical campus. Um, but, you have questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. Other questions? Do you yeah. have more questions? I was wondering if you could just talk a little more about the connection with, you talked a little bit about public education and um, my understanding there was like thousands of teachers that were fired after Katrina. When it seems like it ties in with all the different ways in which working class people were and middle class people were attacked. Um, and and it, my understanding is that was a large group of black homeowners in the city, so a, a very a significant voting. Um, population as well. Well, most of this is a negative voting population because these were, these were, you know, these were community leaders. These were people who had uh, influence over the course of public life. Um, and uh, in, in, at, in September, the first week of September, they decided that they were not going to reopen public, public schools in New Orleans for the 2005 2006 school year. Um, and then uh, a few months later, 
they summarily fired all of the employees of the public school district, even though 97 percent of them were protected by the contract. Um, these are people who had thought they had union protection, people who were earning their pensions, uh, people who were leaders in their communities, and part, that was part of the strategy to the, discourage them from returning. Um, they knew that these, most of these people uh, you know, had families and had financial obligations, not only the children, but perhaps the older parents, that once they were fired, that they had to seek other employment. And many of them, many of them found other employment outside of the world. So the whole idea was to push people out by any means possible. So you saw all of city workers were fired from being in the storm, all school teachers, and when you close public housing, you're talking about the service and tourist industry for mostly black women, low income black women. They're all locked up, right? And so you saw some transplanting happening as well. You saw Bush suspending the Davis Bacon Act, which allowed for contractors to not pay a fair wage or check the documentation, and they bust in an entire labor force and rebuild it again while the city was still closed. So when I snuck into the city with my camera, as far as the eye could see, all Latino workers. I rolled up to a foreman and I said, where are the jobs? He said, we got everybody. How do you have everybody? The city's closed, right? Mm -hmm. And so when the transplanting happened, mm -hmm. uh, they replaced the low-income black women who worked in the tourism service industry with HB2 visa workers from South America and Central America, right? And so it's a transplanting process that happened to create a new labor force that would be, uh, that you'd have to pay less wages to. Right? and put them in conflict with returning residents. So there was that friction that happened in that second vignette that uh, we didn't show the, the full piece on it, but there was much more there right, with the suspension of the Davis Bacon Act. That was two months with no act, two months with no um, uh, work while the work on the hospital was happening, and then everything sort of stopped. And the, the, the other practical effect of that was they wanted to uh, swap out the labor force. They wanted laborers who wouldn't be asserted of their rights. Mm -hmm. just, um, they wanted people who were on a, a special visa so that they spoke up about working conditions. They did. Out of here. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted people who faced language barriers and faced, you know, a really insidious sort of uh, racism from the affluent class here. Mm -hmm. And that was that was really part of the master. Okay, I see where we are. Absolutely and, and the thing about this process is always that there is never enough time. Right. But I do wonder, are you going to stay with us for a little bit or are you going to take off? I don't think I'm going to take off. But okay. we're going to be eating lunch at Golden Feather um, okay. at 1. Okay. At 1 o'clock, right? Uh, around 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock. Okay. So we'll be on the ground. Yeah. So before you go, someone say thank you so much. Thank you. to meet with us this morning and, and uh, the next phase of work for us is to go get go with Bobby Jenner again with this Medicaid expansion, right? And so we're 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 in our still in our planning phases and uh, it's a really good plan that's coming together and folks want to really be engaged with the capital this budget year and legislative session. Yeah and just real quick at lunch uh, we'll tell you about uh, something that Bobby Jindal is doing that if you have a Republican governor is coming to your state soon and it is uh, part of Bobby Jindal's GI on working poor people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, so without further ado. Oh wait. <coughs> oh yes. Oh no. Oh not yet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to. I just want to. I, I feel like sometimes what happens at Rikers Fest is um, we yeah we're in process and we have to move to the next thing, but I feel like we need a collective breath. Yeah. yeah? And um. Just to like make that link when I hear about what's happening with Latino workers being brought in, pitted against African American workers, it reminds me of history I know about what happened in Hawaii with different API populations being pitted against each other and Portuguese. So again, like all these in terms of like connecting these social justice moments, I think that we're seeing a lot of overlap. And um, so what I want to do is just kind of have us take a collective breath. I'm gonna give you a five, and that's not a lot of time. But I want us to at least have a minute. Um, there are. You can actually. Great. Either, either skip or shorten the next part. Yes. Okay. So let's do a ten. You know
know where your bathrooms are? What time? Who has the time? 11.36. It is 11.36. I will give you a three minute and then we'll start again at 11.46. Okay? Great. Go. Thank you. I brought books. Fox, I'm over there. You all get the first snack.
years, I feel like some of those years, especially Karen Atlas and my Yep. 
So I think that's probably in the room, so whatever I share is going to find some connections, hopefully. But I do want to say something, that, but it's short, we just have a little bit of time now. So I'm going to be super happy and just talk about a couple of things and, and go on. But I, I do want to know in the room, because it has to do with what I'm going to talk about, I just want to ask if you would help me get a sense of how you self-define for a moment in a couple of ways. So I'm, I'm not going to ask you to, to limit, but I just want to get a sense of the various um, aspects of you that you bring to this conversation. So for example, if you self-define, you put your hands up as many times as you want, but if you self-define as an artist in any way, whatever that means to you, just put your hand up for a moment, please. If you uh, self-define in any way um, as an activist, put your hand up. If you self-define as an organizer, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah. uh, as a community worker, again, whatever these things mean to you, um, just making stuff up. Uh, as, a, uh, as a cultural worker, okay? Um, as a community-based artist, whatever that means to you. Um, as someone involved in the political process in a way that you would say it is a significant part of the work that you do in your life. Okay, just totally curious. All right, so, so here's the deal. My name is Michael Rode, and I run um, 
uh, two sort of different bodies these days. I run the Social Theater, which is a 13-year-old ensemble-based company that started in Virginia, spent nine of its years in Portland, Oregon, and for the past four or five years has been working around the country. And we actually, different than what Mark said this morning, we are not a place-based company now. We live in eight cities. There are 13 of us. And we regularly work in projects all over. So teams of us are together, sometimes for a couple of years on projects, and sometimes for five-day projects that we spend a year preparing for. So I'm going to describe one or two of those projects a little bit. I also um, lead the recently formed Center for Performance and Civic Practice. And that's a two-year-old uh, entity, and I'm going to talk about that to start with. And the thing that connects both of these things is this idea of civic practice which is my connection to the work that Trapp was talking about today and the way that I think about the legacy of community-based art and community-based performance making existing now in a sort of cross-sector, um, multi-disciplinary way that so many people are working in community settings. So I'm gonna start by saying that um, here's what civic practice has come to mean for me, and then I'll get to hear. Uh, I've been coming, like a lot of you, to conferences for a really, for a while, you know? TCG conferences, alternate roots conferences, net conferences, arts and culture, so many conferences and communities. And I feel like I've been, it's really now I can say it's been over 20 years of sort of being in these conversations where community-based and ensemble and activism, all these terms are so jumbly and have meant different things at different times that I've needed to start to put together a vocabulary for myself. Less to uh, demand that other people take on that vocabulary, but more for me to understand how to talk to people outside my field, which is theater, about the work I do. So I have begun to use the term civic practice and to write about it and to teach about it and to work in it because I have found it very helpful in the last several years. And to me, civic practice isn't just theater, it's across different disciplines, but I'm a theater practitioner, so that's how I frame it for me. It's work that artists do in collaboration with non-arts partners, and I sort of generally say non-arts sector partners, because there's of course a complicated conversation that many of us believe everyone is an artist. So it's not saying, you're not an artist and I'm working with you, but it's saying the arts are, in addition to being many other things, they are a field, right? They are disciplines, they are a field, they are a sector. But they're also connected to so many other areas and sectors. There are people, many, who define their fields and sectors as not being primarily arts focused. Legislative sector, advocacy sectors, business sector, health sector, education sector. And yet, we all know examples of artists working in collaboration in those sectors. Most frequently, although not entirely, but most frequently, my experience of artists working in those other sectors is artists coming up with project ideas and then finding partners in those other sectors and bringing those projects to fruition. And many of those projects have social justice um, impulses, but many don't. Some are projects that somebody realizes you know, this would be really exciting to what I'm about as an artist to partner in this particular setting, I think there will be some positive social impact. But my goal is, this is how I'm gonna make my art, right? So that, that, there's lots of partnerships that we all know have happened for many, many years. I feel like what's starting to get identified more and more the last couple decades, uh, and it's not new, but it's sort of, there's a bit of a light on it in different ways, are when artists work with non-arts sector partners, and the lead impulse is actually the need of the non-art sector partner, as opposed to the vision of the artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So I, I define that as civic practice. When an artist and a non-art sector partner are collaborating, and the artist is bringing their expertise, and they're bringing their vision, and they're bringing their skills, but they are consciously serving the need or desired outcome of a non-art sector partner. Yeah? So, and there's people in this room I know, and many I don't, but like I know people in this room who've been modeling this work for decades, you know? So it's out there. But I find in a lot of settings, I do a lot of capacity building work with artists and non-art sector community members. There is confusion very often because non-art sector partners are used to most frequently being approached by artists 
about partnerships and collaborations that will help realize the vision of the artist. There's nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. Many of us do work, it's not an either or, it's, it's a continuum, right? It's a spectrum. But I know for me, in starting to name the impulse and the context of a project, it becomes easier to communicate about it across partnerships and relationships with funders in educational institutions. So the Center for Performance and Civic Practice, something that I've started and been working on with different people, is specifically about trying to highlight projects around the country going on that are civic practice projects, trying to seed and fund projects that can be documented and cataloged so that projects can exist as models of civic practice. Some of Sojourn's work falls under civic practice, but not all of it. Some of it doesn't at all. Some of it does. This does, and I'll mention this briefly. What I'm really going to talk about is this Catholic Charities project, just for a couple minutes, and then I actually brought something to share with you that's a Chicago Parks project that's going through the center. Um, am I making sense so far? I apologize for my rasp. I'm tail into a cold in the last few days, but it's coming back. Um, I think I'm okay for now. Thank you. Uh, so, I think the way that I would start is I would say um, a project that really got me thinking about civic practice in a, in a way that's helped me move to this entity and be clear about this is we did a show five years ago in Portland, Oregon, where we were based, called Built. Built was about um, demographic change in urban areas and how resources get allotted and where we're going to live. It's so related to what Trap just shared on. We literally spent a year working in Connecticut, uh, Chicago, and then Portland, developing a participatory performance where audience members planned a city together. And the goal of the project was to get people in the room who would not normally be in planning conversations. And they were with political leaders, they were with planners, they were with other audience members, and they were diverse in many different ways that diversity can relate to an audience. They were diverse geographically, they were diverse socioeconomically, they were diverse culturally. They were also, very importantly, diverse ideologically, which for us is a big primary concern with a lot of projects. Anyway, we did the project, and a lot of, oh, part of the project was we invented a participatory civic planning board game. So as a part of the show, and I won't go into detail because some of you have seen this presentation at, um, in Appalachia, so I won't, I won't do a lot of this, but basically there was a board game we created and it was a part of the performance event and audience members played it at different moments amidst the performance. I should say Alyssa, who we met, who for years was uh, Sojourn's managing director, produced the event that I'm talking about and is intimately acquainted with it. Um, because the show had this game, planners would come and get really interested and say like, oh, we, this, this would be really cool in a planning setting. And we'd sort of talk to them a little bit. And it, it wasn't clear to them how to pull it out of the show because it was a part of a larger performance event. But we found ourselves intrigued enough that we spent a few years in kind of quiet conversation with different folks. And then about a year and a half ago, um, Rocco Landsman at the NEA did all this cross-agency uh, funding opportunities. One of them was the HUD and the EPA and the NEA Sustainable Communities um, Grant. And most of us artists, we didn't know about it. People didn't know about it. The word didn't get out. But it was, it was like $100 million that went out around the country to regions to apply for to do creative planning around sustainable communities. And so in Virginia, in the New River Valley, which is at the intersection of five uh, counties, uh, which contain a lot of impoverishment, actually, in these five counties. Uh, their planning commission had heard about our project, and they contacted us through Bob Leonard, who many of you know, and we went down and met with them, and they felt that they were having an incredible amount of trouble getting people on ideologically different sides of planning issues into rooms, having meaningful dialogue that could lead to resource allotment proposals for local government. So we went down, we demonstrated the game, we talked to them, they got super excited, they used some of the NEA HUD money, and they commissioned us to adapt the game for their regional planning commission. We did it, we spent a few months in planning stuff, and I want to note that I was, I was working on civic practice ideas, this was coalescing for me, but I started to realize that, okay, so, the assets that we as artists are bringing to this conversation we're having with these planners, the assets are clearly 
things like, we have invented an activity that brings imaginative acts and expressive actions into a space that is normally people sitting around a table or watching a presentation and then sort of voting for things. So there's this element of imagination and expression. Those are assets we have as artists. We bring the ability to facilitate a dynamic dialogue between people who may have different perspectives. We're bringing the ability or the uh, attempt to build coalitions out of a variety of stakeholders with different self-interests. Yes? So these are assets we felt like we brought, and their needs were clear. They needed dialogue, and they needed actually data on resource allowed. But they were very open to how the data would be gathered. We modified the game, and the short of it is, it went really well. And it's now, for six, eight months, been the primary public engagement tool in these five counties for their plan. And they went and presented it at a national conference a couple months ago that HUD hosted. And as a result of that, we've now been engaged out in Oregon, in Kansas, in Maryland. Different regional planning commissions are connecting with us to modify this project to be a local arts-based tactic for their plan. And it's super exciting because I feel like we understand what the asset is. The game changes each time, but it sort of has a, the, the elements of it that are consistent are clear enough that we can modify in location-specific ways. So that example of civic practice has been really helpful as we've begun to sort of have these conversations about when we develop relationships that are not begun because we want to make a show, but are begun because we want to develop this partnership. We feel like we might have some assets that could be useful here, but we're not going to presume to come in with a proposal. What we're going to do is attempt to build a relationship and listen and learn. And over an extended period of time, as we start to learn the needs as articulated by the non-arts partner, we're going to see if we feel like we have assets that we can bring to match those needs. And then we're going to see what kind of proposal we can bring to the table. And the thing that feels important to me in addition to the legislative aspect of this, uh, and this is something I was um, talking about somewhere last week, uh, at Under the Radar last week, there was a, a panel the other day on, on um, social practice and the arts and how it's connecting to community. And on that panel, I was saying that the thing that's often happening between artists who are engaging in this work and artists who are not a part of this work is there's this sense that, well, you know, the real innovation happens in art studios and it happens away from community and then we open the doors to community. And actually, the truth is, I, I believe the truth, we can say the truth is, <laughs> something I believe is that, uh, <laughs> something, capital yeah, capital T. Capital T. <laughs> something I think is the case is that when we open ourselves process wise, to being in conversation with folks outside our sector and outside our sphere and outside our daily experience, we are actually led to innovate formally, practice-wise, much more strikingly than when we work alone in our studios. Also, amazing innovation happens in our studios. But there is something that happens when we are engaging in relation to needs and in relation to relationship that demands we explore things in different ways. And so this takes me to what's become clear to me about this. And that is, for, for me and my company and the Center for Performance and Civic Practice, we are having to recognize that when you talk, for instance, as a theater person about bringing your practice uh, into other sectors, people immediately assume you are talking about plays. Because it is the product in our field that is the most recognizable and makes the most sense to someone who perhaps is not in our field. So part of the capacity building and advocacy that we are doing at the center and that Sojourn does project by project is actually constantly articulating that theater does not necessarily equal play. Theater equals a broad spectrum of performance and process and practice and tactics and strategies and for me, for me, if it's a time-based event that includes intentional, imaginative acts and expressive actions, then I'm calling it theater. Everybody can have their own definition, but for me, that's, that's where it's at. And I think about how to build a forest. 
You know, Katie and Lisa's project as one of many examples as a project where, like, there's a lot of people who would say, well, how is that theater, that's installed, it's whatever. I don't even know if you guys call it theater. For me, it's theater, and it's exciting theater, because whatever you've been exploring in that inquiry as I've read about it, that's a form you came up with in relation to so many questions you were asking. So for us, we are trying to move that conversation with partners outside the arts towards the notion that you are perhaps, in our case, working with a theater practitioner, you might work with a photographer, you might work with a dance artist, a visual artist, all of us collaboratively. What we come up with is not limited by what you already know about the form that you assume I come from. Do you know? That, to me, feels crucial. So, for instance, I'm going to do time. Okay, okay. Because um, I have, I actually have uh, one of the sort of subtitle of this brief session is translations as being, I think, the key tool for so many of us in the work we're doing today. So I brought for you um, a brief proposal that has moved through Chicago's legislative world and is up at the mayor's office with the superintendent. And I want to show you the translation work we've done uh, around that. So, but first I'm going to mention this. We got kind of, I wrote something about this on HowlRound, so some of you might have read this lately, but there's an essay from about a week ago about Catholic charities and some work Sojourn has been doing. This started as a Sojourn project, and it's now a collaboration between Sojourn and the Center. And basically, Catholic Charities USA, which is the largest entity in the United States serving uh, those living in poverty or around poverty, which I didn't know, they approached us about a year and a half ago because they'd seen us at another conference. And they said, hey, we're really interested in partnering with you on a conference in 2012. Uh, we don't know what that means, but we'd love to talk to you. And it began about nine months of conversation to determine what is this organization? What do they do? What do they need? And what do we have that could serve them? We ended up at their national conference in St. Louis in this past October. I'd never been to St. Louis. Um, it was really interesting. And it was almost a thousand people from all over the U.S. Uh, who work for agencies supported by the Catholic Charities USA Network. So they don't work for Catholic Charities, but they all worked in poverty-serving organizations that had some portion of their funding. through, And they come together for a five-day gathering to work on poverty. Amazing people. Amazing people. Many of you are partnered with people doing work around that issue, but these are folks doing all kinds of work all over the, the country and beyond. And of course, they're not all Catholic. It's not a proselytizing set of agencies. Um, and Catholic Charities is a, is a dialogical entity with an ontological hierarchy. They're in the church. Father Larry Snyder is a papal appointee. But Catholic Charities USA does not work following papal edicts except when papal edicts directly contradict their policy. And one of the things they wanted us to do was open that up and help their community start a conversation about those tensions. So the shortest version I can tell of this is that we went to their conference and over the course of the five days, we interviewed 100 people one on one to gather material, but also to ask questions that would ripple into their convening. So I, I want to point out that our goal was to come up with performative strategies that were not limited to the performance that we would share at the end of the conference, which we did. So our one-on-one -on -one interviews literally were, how do we seed the conversations that are hardest for this organization to have in one-on-one -on -one encounters, and then hope they ripple out? We gave a workshop on policy. We are not experts on poverty policy. So we came up with a, a two-hour session where we um, took 60 people through, uh, I feel like I should give you a moment, it looks dangerous. <laughs> you okay? Is it okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, fine. Um, we came up with a workshop, right, yeah, thanks. We came up with a, oh, it's totally different now. We came up with a workshop <laughs> where, um, <laughs> where we basically broke the room into groups and a sojourn artist was at every table and uh, the sojourn artist became a candidate for congressional office and this table had to come up with a platform for poverty reduction 
that they thought A would be effective and B would actually be electable in a region that they chose. So they coached this person to become a candidate. And then we pulled people from the room, including uh, two DC policy lawyers on poverty, to be a press corps. And every sojourn performer came up front and they improvised from an informed place because they'd been coached a stump speech for two minutes. And then they were questioned by the press corps and they had someone from their group coaching them, like consulting, spinning their <laughs> ear. And then at the end, there was a debrief and we talked about what policies really were standing out, what were the hard part. I mean, it was really, it was very exciting for them. For us, we learned a ton, but what actually happened was the room came out with a platform that they didn't have going in. And then the two lawyers were charged with spending the hour after our two hours in helping these folks move that into actual advocacy work that they could take home in their districts. So it was, it was super fun and exciting. Another thing we did was I did a, a half day workshop with, um, with executive directors from around the country on just, this is something I wanted to make sure I said, how many people in here ever spend time in rehearsal rooms? Okay, rehearsal rooms. Rehearsal rooms. So a lot of people. Rooms where work happens collaboratively. Let's say that. So these are folks who are living and working in ideologically polarized times. We all know that, everybody knows that. But if you're somebody who's trying to move an anti-poverty agenda forward in a, for instance, predominantly conservative area, and you are attempting to find ways that policy that might seem progressive can gather stakeholders from across the ideological spectrum, you probably could use some time spent on how collaboration works. You know how collaboration works if you're that person, but you also don't actually have a lot of intentional tools necessarily. So we did a half day on collaboration, on narrative, on framing, using sort of performance process as a way to think about that. Super exciting. So many people here could lead a session like that. Part of the work of the Center for Performance and Civic Practice is to say legislative work and impactful work does not only look like advocacy as powerful and specific as what Trapp shared with us. It also looks like sharing assets and skills we have in spaces where those assets and skills could be useful. The rooms in this country where decisions are made and yet where there are, there is so little knowledge on how to work together, vision imaginatively, and problem solve creatively is astonishing. And as the mayor covers your face, no, it's true. It is so true at the local level, the state level, and the national level. How important would it have been when Biden had the task force the week before last to have an artist in that room, not to be in charge, but to help with the process of what happened in that room, which was basically a series of monologues. What could actually happen if you have the amazing people you had gathered in there with Allison facilitating that meeting, with some kind of creative practice in that session? So that, that's what this is. It's not not doing plays, but it's that's not all we do. Like, that's not all we do. So it's looking at those skills and assets. Um, so I think the last thing I would say about Catholic Charities is, as a result of how well that event went, which included a performance and some other stuff, we're now their artists in residence for the next 18 months. We're going to 14 sites around the country, teams of sojourn artists. Uh, we're gonna be in Iowa in two months, a month later we're gonna be in um, Maine, we're gonna be in Philadelphia a month and a half after that. And at each site for regional gatherings, we're gonna be giving workshops, creating small performances, going out doing interviews with clients and staff, and then we're gonna be at their national convenings for the next two years, creating performance events based on all that local work. We're also dramaturgically helping them structure their national convenings so that they are thinking more creatively about the way they make spaces for people to be skilled in. So that's come directly from thinking about not what's the thing I wanna do with Catholic Charities that satisfies me as an artist, which I'm doing in other contexts. I'm not, not doing the stuff I want to do as an artist, but in these contexts, I'm really learning and deeply, deeply satisfied by being in response to a need that I find of value in our communities. So there's that. And then the last one I want to share about is um, Chicago Parks. Uh, I didn't know this, 
but Chicago Parks and Natural Resources is the largest parks district in the United States. There are 550 parks in Chicago. I didn't know. Um, many of them exist in neighborhoods in Chicago that the city calls uh, underserved, and all that goes with the terminology underserved. So apparently just before Mayor Rahm came in, there was a lot of um, planning of new summer programming. This was for last summer. It had happened before he got there. So they do all this programming last summer in underserved communities, and very few people go. So Ron comes in, and he says to his superintendent of Parks and Natural Resources, well, let's make sure that doesn't happen next summer and the summer after. Let's make sure people participate in our parks. And people say, that sounds great. How should we do that? And the mayor says, you should do that. <laughs> so I get a call. Um, the uh, deputy, there's a new deputy uh, chair of the Department of Cultural Arts in Chicago named Angel Aguirre who's on TCG's board and used to be at Boeing, and I've known him for a while, and he's this uh, great, great, smart guy. Um, and uh, he told the deputy superintendent of parks and natural resources to talk to me about civic practice. And the guy, I think, felt like Angel had said he had to talk to me, so the guy called me. Um, and we had this great talk, and this guy is a, uh, a floral, like he's a nature guy with a bit of experience, but he's got a lot of oversight over arts and culture stuff, and he doesn't completely know what he's doing, and he was upfront about that. And he said, well, we have to do something, what should we do? And I said, well, certainly you guys have done participatory planning to develop programs in neighborhoods, right? Certainly you've done that before. <laughs> and he said, and he said, uh, he said no, no, we've, we've never done that. And I said, are you telling me that you have never worked with the people in the neighborhoods to talk about what the assets are and what the needs are as you have planned programming for 550 parks. He said, that is not how we develop programming. And I said, would you like some ideas? <laughs> and he said, yes. So I met with him, I listened a lot, and then I, uh, I wrote this, and got a little bit of feedback from him, and then, and then wrote what you're reading now. And I actually called him yesterday. Uh, wait, I don't want to give it out until I'm done talking, because I know what I would do, I would read it. Um, I called him yesterday and I said, I'm going into this meeting tomorrow, I just want to know where it's at. And he said, uh, well, funny, you, you called today, because he presented it to the superintendent, the superintendent's staff yesterday, who's all in, and it's now that superintendent, the deputy superintendent, are presenting it to the mayor's staff next week. In the possibility that this will actually be a planning process that the city goes through in partnership with the center. But the reason I want you to read it is this is very specifically a, a translation. Um, this, is, this is actually going, is this live streaming right now? So, live streaming, that last part should be a little, keep it in your house. If you're live streaming this right now. I'm, I'm sharing something that isn't necessarily for the world, it's just for you at home right now. Not to necessarily tweet or put on Facebook, but just to sort of have with you until it's actually a little more public. Thank you, live stream. Thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, let's pass this around, and this is sort of involved in the act of translation, and I'm, I just want to share it with you, and then I'm going to collect them again. Take a moment and read it, if, if you would. Just because I, I just feel like it's, it's an, I don't know, I want to talk about the translation thing going on. Thank you. 
useful thing to me. Yeah. Yeah. tools I want to get on the, on the center's sort of library is different versions, different templates of language that people can just use to riff on around access in different, because it really is a matter of just people speak different languages in different fields, but how do you also speak about the value of artistic practice in different fields without it just being, the arts are great, the arts are positive, the arts are important, and without evaluative data. What's, what's, what's just the language of, here's something I think we bring to this conversation, but because we're on limited time, can I suggest, and I want to make it not just me sort of talking at you guys, I think I have about eight minutes left, so maybe just turn to like a person or two next to you, just for like three minutes or so, and I wonder what's on your mind at this moment, as I've talked about a couple specific projects, I've talked about civic practice, and then you have this sort of example of language and trying to framework. How does this kind of connect with you in terms of your own work or what might it make you curious about or what does it make you want to interrogate? And then we'll turn out and for the last couple minutes talk as a group. Is that okay? So maybe turning to the person near you or next and I'm just gonna walk around this. Meet a new friend.
few moments and then we'll come back. Do you know how many people are watching? How many people? Seven people here. Do you know where they are? I have a book in the analytics. There are seven of you watching right now. And we are so thrilled that you are with us. I lost my voice. All right. Coming back. Coming back. Coming back. Coming back. Coming back. Coming back. And turning it to you. Thoughts. What are you talking about? What are, what are your conversations about right now? What's interesting? Kathy Randall, what's on your mind? Um, how do you convince? How do you convince? Well, this is my Catholic art itself. How, where does the money come from for these projects? Yeah, yeah. Well, I can tell you for these different ones. I told you that, for instance, this one came from the cross-agency money, the planning commission. Michael, what are you pointing to now? Oh, sorry, built. This is built. So that, um, actually, many of the poorest regions in the United States got that HUD NEA money for sustainable communities and still have some that isn't spent, that has to actually be spent soon. So that money came out of that grant cycle here. Catholic Charities came from Catholic Charities, and they are actually locally doing a bit of fundraising in the local, but the national office is taking on most of that. And I imagine if the Chicago Parks project happens, that that money will be city money. Right. And that, sorry, just on that, that, that came from yeah. Trapp's question about, or, or indication of, we needed that here, post Katrina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and who would have said yes to that? Or how, like, and it gets back to you saying, we have to, we have to constantly talk about the value of, of what we do. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm gonna take a contrary view and mm -hmm. say, Trap, even if you have this tool, I don't think we're gonna make any difference. No, not the way to believe because, <laughs> uh, because I think one of the things about political will, political capital, and the people who, are, who have the power are not truly invested in this sort of equitable process, it's right. window dressing. Right, right. And so my challenge would be, this is so exciting, you know I'm a huge fan, but I would have to suspend judgment on this until five or 10 years when I see what kind of resources Chicago City is putting into its parks. If we, the people, say well, we need more parks, this needs to be upgraded, this is dangerous, this needs to be torn down, we need to add this, it's gonna cost $350 million, you know, over five years. Well, um, it's too bad about that. Um, so, I mean, that's, the, that's that, the, the man behind the curtain that you just have to acknowledge that is there. So I, I really, I wonder if you if you had it. You know, I'm, I'm just here's, thinking. here's how I'll push back on it. One quick second. The, the engagement around the census allowed us to see how federal dollars, our tax dollars, really float down. Um, and, and, you know, post uh, census and, and redistricting, right? So, the, so when you're counting, the money flows within your borders as opposed to around. But then, what we have to do as responsible citizens is find that money. Right. Brookings did a study called Surveying for Dollars. We've been able to track to, across issue where issue dollars are going, right? We call it issue dollars. We're talking about health dollars, right? DHA gets all of our money from, from the federal government, and the nonprofits have to line themselves up with the government agencies so that money can get to the ground, right? We didn't need it at Blake yet. We would look, we were using that model, but we didn't learn all that stuff until 2009, right? <laughs> and so now we're looking at how do we build sustainable communities with the knowledge that we have from and could I, could I also say, just Kathy, thinking about what you asked, and, and Kathy, thinking about what you said, um, I, I want to make sure that I don't give the impression that I think this work is just about large-scale projects. Because actually what's really important to me is, um, is that, and one of the first initiatives that the center is working on, something called the Catalyst Initiative, is that People are doing and can do projects that bring artist assets to bear on non-art sector needs in like 50 hours over two and a half months. 
And I could be citing those kind of projects as well. I, I, there's a project in Chicago right now called Now is the Time, which is a response to youth gun violence in Chicago. And it's all these teen councils from around the city that have gotten together with arts organizations. And one of their particular programs is they're gonna make proposals to the mayor and the mayor's staff on how the city legislatively can do better job of getting young people involved in stopping youth, youth gun violence. And I was asked to come and, and meet with and listen to this group, and it's this amazing group of teenagers from all over the city having great conversations. But you know what? They didn't know how to get from A to B. They had, a, they had stories, they had opinions, they had desires, and they had a goal, which is in mid-May they're gonna do such and such. So I literally went in as a civic practitioner, I, I you know, volunteered. I said, no, I'd like to work with this group some. And we just sat down and said, what do you need to know to be able to make proposals that will be smarter than the proposals you would make today in August? What do you need to learn? Who do you need to learn from? Who do you need to connect with? Where, what rooms do you want to be in? And we came up with an entire plan for these public forums that they're hosting and that they've invited, you know, anti-gun activists to, and the superintendent of public safety, and everybody says yes to that. Everybody, they can get anybody in Chicago to come in a room in a way that none of us can. Like people will come in the room and be interviewed by them, and then we do, you know, facilitation structure, a little storytelling and stuff we all do. But they needed the help of synthesizing their goals and of creatively imagining a plan to get to their proposals. And I just felt like, okay, I know what my assets are in this room. I know what you want to happen. You don't need to make a play. You don't need to perform those proposals in May. But you do need creatively and effectively to get from here to there. So how are we gonna use some rehearsal room tactics to figure out what you need and then make these events performative and dynamic, but about knowledge gathering? So it is like, there are so many scales that we can bring our assets to bear on. I just want to note that. You know, just, I'd like to just tag on that. <coughs> I'm on the periphery. I'm not a theater practitioner, but I'm on the periphery of, uh, of it, and, uh, and close to a lot of people who are. Uh, stuff that I do is more writing and design, but I've done a lot in the past couple of years with the uh, civic technology uh, uh, of a lot of people working on civic technology projects. And one of the biggest challenges in that whole community is that you've got these designers, developers, uh, data scientists who are coming into the space. Uh, they don't have, they don't really know how to engage communities. So they're building these like data visualizations, these maps, these like mobile apps that don't actually serve the needs that people That's have. Right. That's right. And one of the things that um, Michelle and I have been talking about for a while, some other people in that space, uh, the kind of straddle <laughs> between civic arts and civic tech is how can uh, how can something like civic practice may possibly be a way to get these these people who have are, you know the arts assets, the technology assets, and people in different communities who have real needs to like all engage in the dialogue and create arts projects and technology projects that serve real needs, and I think there's a lot of potential there. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things civic practice that's really exciting me um, mm -hmm. as I learned about it. So just wanted to add on. Yeah, yeah. Other, I, I don't know if I should you or see if there's other, um, what do you think? This is a good transition for mm -hmm. here. Because I really, um, really appreciate, Michael, the way that you opened up for us to kind of start to think about how this connects to our own work. And I appreciate that you offered us a tactile way to think about translation and I think track to the way that you offered us very clear ways to see how we are able to translate. So I want to um, kind of move in this vein and ask other people to just think about your work. How does translation work in your work? Is that part of your work? Um, translating between artistic practice or non-arts practice and um, translating with um, stakeholders or community participants? Seems to me like theater, I mean, as a theater artist, I'll say that I think that theater artists are speaking multiple languages at the same time. Mm -hmm. We have the language, the, the, the language that we think about. We also have the language of gesture. We have the language about the use of space. We have the language of uh, dance and choreography. Those are all intersecting and layered languages. So it seems like that as theater practitioners, anyway, we're 
we, we dwell in a multilingual um, you know, space. Um, I don't know where I was going with it, but. <laughs> but that makes it me think like it was important to say. <laughs> but I come back to what, and will you tell us your name you just shared with your, what's your name? Oh. Uh, Paul. Paul, great, and will you say your name there? Kathy. So what Paul and Kathy, when you were talking to Paul, what that made me think of is right. And in, and in theater, we have people who are part of each of those genres. I have a set designer, I have a sound designer, I have, I have people of different genres who all come together to have this conversation about how to make the work come together in a way that layers for not only us as artists, but our audiences or our, our folks are interacting. Other folks, how's the transition? Well, one thing I just want to point out since we're in New Orleans is that, you know, we're talking about how theater looks differently and what, what, that it's not just always about a play. I mean, the theater happens here all over the place, right? In Second Line, Mardi Gras Indians, and parades, and so there's a rich culture of theatrical, sort of performative um, um, dialogue, expression, that really asserts the values of um, community um, and different communities, and those could be different values. And, um, the, so I just wanted to make that connection and point out that um, it might not be engaging in, this, in, in you know, directly um, a civic engagement in the ways that we would talk about, but I think it's um, a really important element. And um, you know, at Jumba Productions, we try to try to value that and um, um, support that kind of work. Did you say anything? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Kyoko McCray. Oh, and one one last thing I wanted to say is that. Um, Seems like you're talking a lot about um, civic engagement, uh, for sure, um, and working with social service organizations. And I was wondering if you had experience working with like people who do organizing work or who work for social justice. You know, which I think are social change, which is a little different than and not to, not to value one over the other. But you know, what, what are the different dynamics? I think organizers sometimes understand this work a little better, have more of a vision um, for an imagination uh, for looking at creative ways to. Whether it's to dialogue or I can, I can say very quickly one big difference is um, I didn't I didn't I didn't talk about this but if you if you look at these projects they are actually not straight advocacy projects mm -hmm. they are inquiry projects or gathering projects that might have advocacy consequences mm -hmm. most frequently when we were working with social justice organizers and people who specifically are doing social change work, they would often want us to be deliverers of the message. Sure. And, and we actually don't do that. Mm -hmm. So we only work with organizers or social justice organizers if they are interested in the inquiry and the gathering where they might, their message yeah. and their agenda may be a part of what they're bringing to the work, but that our participation is not negating other voices from <coughs> being a part of the project. Of individual community empowerment, and, and you know, which is what I see this work you're doing with the, the young people is a rehearsal for democracy. I mean, that's absolutely there. That's it's, it is totally possible to have an advocacy position about that because there are plenty of people that would, would really just assume you didn't do that. I agree, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you're, you're, yes, Mickey, um, and so a couple of things. I uh, hear Thank you for an organizing, because it's kind of like organizing the very practice of it is using those cultural tools. So if you look at the civil rights movement, the songs we shall overcome that are still impacting and it's funding projects today, all of that is is is, is right theater, right? And so I, I hear what you're saying about organizing, organizers being able to look at it a little bit differently. The second thing is if you guys recall the, the story of the Tower of Babel, and if you guys don't recall, you know, like back in the Bible days, people were all trying to build this tower to like reach God, and then God was like, uh uh, like now I'm gonna, you got all different languages, right? And it never got done. And so when we're talking about translation, I think that it's, it's Babel when people are trying to learn or present new things, or if, even if it's not new, it's just someone's different take on it, mm -hmm. or different words they're using, but because we're battling, mm -hmm. we do not work together to get the work done, and so what you've done is so essential, or in your attempt, or just with this specific piece, but on a more macro level, that ha needs to happen more and be able to get more people to work towards the same thing. Otherwise, we're battling and we won't build the tower. And then the third thing I was thinking about when Trap was presenting, and even we're talking about issues like youth gun violence or things like that, 
the, uh, and coming from a psychological perspective, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. So if your housing, and your education, and your food is not what it should be, you don't realize self-actualization, which in my mind is people being able to think about or participate in plays or theater or art. And But I think people need to stop thinking of the arts or theater as self-actualization because what it really is is the very essence of what we are and makes us up is something that contributes to our basic needs. Um, and so I've, I guess I've been thinking about like how um, how can we do better at helping helping this be more infused as our daily, our base needs, arts, music, visual arts, performing arts, like those needs to be, and it's not right now considered like a basic need, but really like knowing who I am, being connected to a culture, a community, being able to see myself represented in a mural or books in the library that have people that have my skin color, mm -hmm. like that contributes to my uh, quality of life and well-being. And so it's just something, a kind of aha moment for me and just something to think about. Okay, before I take you, Sam, I just want to ask you to think about what is the, voc and I appreciate the way, Michael, that you phrased it, what is the vocabulary that you use to talk about your work? Because one of the things I'm particularly fascinated by is the words we're learning in each of the regions. Mm -hmm. Like, I learned room porn in Detroit. I learned Appalachian in Appalachia. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> power pill, like, is the word I'm taking today. <laughs> so think about that, because that's also really critical, I think, in this situation. I wanted to build on what Mickey was saying um, and take us back to the biggest perception shift for me about Michael's talk was that um, being a theater artist doesn't necessarily be making Place. Like it needs a lot about process, about point of view, about an understanding. And um, I was at the gym, and I so I think a lot about why art isn't as integrated into this our world as it could be. And I was at the gym, I was on my cross trainer, and on the little TV player there was a TV show that was funded in part by the NEA. So there was the announcement at the end, and it gave the tagline of the NEA, which said the National Endowment for the arts, because a great country deserves great art. And I thought that is the problem right there, because the NEA, which is the federal organization responsible for the health of the artistic life of this country, is positing art as like a treat you get yeah. for being a good country, <laughs> rather than positing it as, a, it as something that's necessary for a country great or important, if not necessary, valuable. And so that's been something I've really been chewing over that came up for me in this conversation. What was the show? <laughs> oh, what I was, was the great artist? I, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Downton Abbey or something. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a PBS show. Yeah. 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 I want to say your name before we love it. I'm Katie. Great. I'm Sage. Um, uh, so one of the things I've been playing with during this conversation, some of the timeline, and it, 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 um, it's connected to kind of what Kathy Dean was saying around the length of time in which, um, from this kind of relationship building with the person, the non-arts partner, how that locks in, how the relationship builds to the point that you even come up with whatever it is that you might want to do together, and then how long post that um, before you actually get a sense of um, that this has kind of been infused or locked in. And I, I was thinking in my mind, well, gee, that's quite an extended relationship. And then you blew my mind and you said, oh, I have been two months sometimes. And so if you could talk to the difference between um, what, is, uh, what is the relationship and what is the value left of the non-arts partner in those kind of extended year, two year long pieces and in the, the shorter kind of two months. Um, yeah, I mean, I could give examples, but I, I feel like um, I don't know, I'm aware of time. Should I talk about that a little? Or? Yeah, I think you can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to acknowledge that we didn't have the formal, like, and now Michael's done, and now we're in the big thing, but I think that it connects, and I think there's examples in the room, like you said, of different yeah, yeah. people's projects. But I wonder if you want to just um, answer Yeah, that. sure. Um, sure, I'll give, you, I'll give you, like, one short example. Um, I had a, a, a graduate student working with me on um, on uh, this idea of civic practice. He wanted to, he's a director, and he comes from New York City, and he comes from New York City. Community-based work, but um, he was really interested in what would happen if he didn't come to somebody with a project. So we did a 10-week exploration together, and what he had to do was he had to find 
a partner organization, either on campus or off campus, that was completely unrelated to any life experience that he had. And he had to find an organization that was willing and interested in having some conversations with him where he would just listen and learn about them. Um, they weren't committing to taking on any kind of projects, but that they were open to seeing what he might have to offer them. So he uh, chose uh, and began to work with the Muslim Student and Faculty Association. And he's a pretty, pretty straight up East Coast waspy guy who had no experience really outside his own faith experience, except for the few Jews like me that he encountered over his years. Um, so he began to develop a, a relationship with this organization by going and setting up a meeting and then being invited to sit in on one of their meetings and he listened and after three weeks he had an idea for a project. He said he was going to go to them and say, I think what they need is they need a show that really gives people on campus uh, a sense that they are um, more than just their faith. They need an opportunity to tell those stories. And he came to me right before he was going to meet with them. And I said, okay, three weeks, you've been listening. And I'm going to say to you that because we're in a sort of course situation right now, I'm going to say you're not allowed to, to, to do anything like that for three more weeks. You can't make a pitch or a proposal. You just have to keep listening. And I want you to keep listening to what you think they need and want. I want you to ask them what they need and want, what their challenges are. So three weeks later, he comes back to me and he says, well, I mentioned you. <coughs> Excuse me, that idea to one of my partners. Sorry. <coughs> and they said that wasn't at all something they were interested in. <laughs> what they were actually interested in uh, was being seen as a site for cross cultural dialogues on campus. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to represent themselves mm -hmm. as these are our stories, we're exotic and we're not exotic. They wanted to be a site for connectivity beyond their own community. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> he took a couple more weeks and he made the trip. And he came back to them with a different proposal. And he basically met with them for a couple hours each week. And they, uh, they loved the proposal, which was, he said, I want us to work with a photographer and we're going to set up um, a fictional photography studio on campus where we are fictionally creating the brochure ad for next year's campus brochure. Mm -hmm. And we're creating the front cover. And we're going to have it open, and students can stop by. And whoever comes in in each group, they're going to come in, and we're going to facilitate, perform with them. And we're going to have to decide what faces and bodies need to be on the brochure cover to represent the diversity of this campus. What are the clothes that need to be there? Do you know what I mean? What needs to be covered? What are the genders? So he basically created this workshop, which was open, and which was sort of playfully mysterious, but people would come in and take it. And they loved it, and they did it, and it was fantastic. And he now has an ongoing relationship with them. So in, in my mind, that's an example of short term, somebody saying, I'm gonna take the time to learn. It's in a bubble environment of a university, but I could give, you know, I could give other examples of outside a university, but that comes to me as a quick one versus somebody working for a few years, versus the work in state prison that Kathy's done here, which is years and years and years of work. And you know, you could tell us the story of how long it took to build the trust, to get to which steps of the programs that you've done here, to actually having a graduate program post-school and the different kind of relationships you build. But I'm, I'm someone who kind of believes that we have to be so super intentional about ethics and responsibility, and we also have to be supremely reckless. We have to have both those things going on. I'm personally not willing to wait five to 10 years to see how one project went to decide if I'm gonna do the next three, as long as I'm learning and continuing to work and trying to be as responsible as I can. But I'm gonna know more five to 10 years later that's gonna make all that practice better. So. And that makes me think about, um, and I think we've kind of heard it in different ways, is some of these projects exist within a funding pool or a timeline, and so to think about resources, like how do we get resources to have conversations? And the other thing I just want to jump back to Kyoko's question about participating with organizers, and I think one of my challenges as an artist who does organizing is that early on in my experience with social justice non-artist organizers was the disvaluing of my work mm -hmm. because it doesn't achieve their results. 
And I think that in this conversation about translation, thinking about how, and I think Michael, you provided us with some really great tools, and Trapani, I think too, like, you showing us ways where we're able to translate our assets in ways to help other agencies use their resources to get at their needs, right? And I think that the thing I appreciated about the power field was it was a way to translate a cultural asset that people did not understand <coughs> in terms of their very right and like you grounded it in such a clear historical context of citizenship that it couldn't help but to me like activate me as somebody who's like now I have this resource and now I want to get up and register to because I know that's an issue that's going on where I live and so I just wonder like there's any other thoughts for folks about how you're translating your work to non-artists um, or if you're non if you're not necessarily an artist identified how do you translate to artists either your needs or your assets so I'm wondering because a lot of this seems one way, like like how artists can help this this you know either social service organizations, whatever. But are we considering the the inverse? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because it's a lot Exchange. of like yeah, yeah. You know, it's a lot of like let us come help you and impart our wisdom using the tools that we have. You know, and I'm just wondering. I don't know. I just. Does anybody in the room have an example of like an opportunity where a non-artist sector partner might have approached you as an artist or an arts organization or a company that you've worked with? Is there any? Um, I'm going to a little bit about this. I did a thesis project where a uh, city planning PhD student approached me and she had heard about some theater work I had done and together we created a project where um, we used applied theater and site-specific performance workshops to bring people down to an urban creek area in Austin that's being redeveloped. And I knew nothing about this before she brought me in, and so we developed this together. And the exchange part is that um, we spent a ton of time trying to figure out, you know, she's like, what is it by you know, I'm asking her what is it, you know, going back and forth. And um, what's great is that she, she was really excited to learn some tools from me, and she actually uses them in her classroom now. She she talks about them with other city planners, so I think there's something that she took from that practice that, that came out of our work together that I wouldn't, if, if she had just approached me and said, teach me something, I wouldn't have known what she needed. But throughout that process, I figured out where that intersection was and where the, she was saying, there's a disconnect between this and this. What, what can we do? <coughs> myself about what I didn't know, basically, which I'm still wondering what I need to learn. And I also want to just point out that around that, I think, Mickey, that most often, very often, theater artists, particularly in um, more mainstream institutions, reach out into their communities for the knowledge that they need or the resources they need to make projects happen. So I feel like the sort of asset need thing often actually goes the other way. And I feel like by sort of intentionally framing it as seeing it as viable and valuable to go the other way, actually it tilts more towards an exchange than it traditionally is. And I would also say, for instance, in the Catholic Charities Project, all of us working on that are getting our gainings. I mean, I'm learning so much about organizing and about, and about equity and, and lenses for that that's affecting my life as well as my work. And I would also say, though, I mean, Michael, I'm thinking about, I mean, so many of those sojourn projects, like the, I think there is a real, uh, partners that you partner on in the way Michael has been talking about in this framework that is not about producing a play or whatever, well, part of what you're also doing as an artist and a company is also doing other work where you are producing plays. And those long-term relationships that you have built with those partners suddenly become the networks and their populations that now are either audience or research material or the um, like I'm thinking about like so many of the doors that open sort of exponentially along the way because the person in this sector who knew this person who knew this you know government per who we would never have gotten to that ended up resulting in funding or audience or you know visibility for the company and the company's work and the plays you know, that, that was part of that ongoing relationship. I think, I think that's part of how it comes to. The thing that comes to mind in Los Angeles after the riots rebellion in 92, when FEMA was in town, they gave money to National Conference for Communities and Justice. Mm -hmm. 
they had a human relations program, and I actually grew up in that. That's how I facilitated. I facilitated since I was 16. You were in that program. I was in that program. So I came out of a human relations program, and then that human relations program, one of the program officers in that program, Danny Pato, her partner husband is married to uh, Ben Donenberg at Shakespeare Center in Los Angeles. And so, in doing all these storytelling projects with young people, they're like, "What do you need?" They're like, "We need somewhere safe to go, and we need a job." So they created a cross partnership between the National Conference of Communities and Justice and Shakespeare Center. They were called Shakespeare Festival at the time. So it was a willpower to youth program that pays young people to spend six weeks with um, professional artists creating a Shakespeare play adaptation. And part of what they do in the play is they they do an adaptation where they pull out the themes that uh, that resonate with them and they create original text around those themes and they integrate it into Shakespeare. So years later. We, they got a Coming Up Taller Award, the Department of Justice and the Department of um, Labor was looking for a project to replicate in Richmond, Virginia. And part of what happens is they're coming together and talking. And so we were able to replicate that program in Richmond using Shakespeare as a work program to also help young people build communication and teamwork skills. So we know that part of the benefit was not just that these young people come out and they can now, they now have access to a Shakespeare play. They now can be able to break down and they understand all of that. But they also had money that went directly to benefit their families and you know while they were in that program. And for a lot of the young people, it was their very first job. It was the very first time that they had adults. You know, there's all these other benefits. So, so I do want us to kind of think broadly about that. And I want to acknowledge that we have to end. But I wonder before we go, because I'm a writer, I wonder if you can think of one vocabulary word that you use to describe your work that you use in your in in how you talk about what you do. And all I want to do is just ask us to go around really quick and just say the vocabulary word, and I invite you. I'll tell you what we'll do after that. So first, <laughs> word. super quick. Yeah, no paragraph, one word. So a word I would use, I have asked the question, <laughs> is dialogue. Sustainability. Interdisciplinary. Healing. Engagement. Multidisciplinary. Interaction. Sacrifice. Leverage. Surrender. Community. Manifesting. Well, intermediary. Access. Integrate. Storytelling. Strategy. Listening. Inquiring. Marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Helpfulness. Engagement. Civic practice. Awesome. So your task between now and lunch is to find someone and ask them what their word was and just to give a quick definition. So we can start to build a mutual vocabulary because there was lots of, you both had the same word, but you may not mean the same thing. Um, all right, so housekeeping things, we want to help clean up this room. Alicia, do you have other things to tell us, stage one? Yeah, so it's 101. We need to pull out on the bus at 110 or very close to it. Before we leave, the next thing that we're going to be doing is going to Congo Square, which is an outdoor space, and then we're going to be going to lunch. I'm supposed to encourage you to use the restroom here before you leave, if we need to do that. I would like to Michael wants to, wants to collect these sheets, so if you can pass them back for yeah. him. Um, the other thing is, if, if one or two folks um, might want to help carry the snack bag back down to the bus with Aaron and I, that would be super appreciated. Yeah, one. Back